Welcome back everyone for today's video. We are going to be taking a look at round number three of the Norway chess event, which is being held here in Savanger. Now, thus far, it's been a little bit choppy for me. I've drawn both of my classical games and I've split the two Armageddon games. I won the first one against Fabiano, but I lost yesterday against Magnus Carlsen. So today in the third round, I'm playing with the white pieces in classical chess. My first white in the event as I started with two blacks in a row against none other than the wonderkin from Iran, Ali Reza Ferugia, who now represents France. Now, in the candidates, Ali Reza was one of the players who struggled the most. He lost to me twice. He also lost a very, very critical 13-round matchup against D. Gukesh from India, which led to Gukesh winning the candidates overall. Nonetheless, new event. Everything starts all over again, and here we go. So I'm playing with the white pieces, and now I play the move d4. Ali Reza plays d5, and I decide to play c4, and he plays this move e6. Here I go knight c3, and now Ali Reza surprises me by playing this move c5. Now this, of course, is what is known as the classic trash defense in honor of Siegbert Trash from Germany. So I trade the pawns on d5, and now I play this move knight f3, and Ali Reza goes knight c6. Now I myself have actually played some of these systems in recent times. Usually I play this move knight f6, and after bishop g5 and bishop e6 here, I had a game against Parham Magsudalu also from Iran in the Qatar Masters event a couple months ago. So this is something that I'm pretty familiar with. So Ali Reza plays knight c6 instead, and now I decide to play this move g3. Now when I play the move g3, one of the things that happens sometimes at my advanced age in chess and having played for so many years is sometimes you forget about some of the possible variations that exist. Now you're probably wondering, well, what do I mean by that? What I mean is that because I've played this a little bit from the black side, I was really expecting Ali Reza to play knight f6 followed by bishop to e7 and castling the king here. This is what is known as a classic setup um, in the Tarash here where black just plays bishop e7. So in my mind, I was thinking about this from the black side of what the possible lines are. And I just played g3 here because I expected Ali Reza to go into the standard line. Now keep in mind, there is this move d takes c5, which oddly enough was played in the women's event here in Norway chess between Humpy Canero and Lei Ting G. And after d4, knight a4, takes, takes. Queen a5, bishop d2, queen c5, e3, knight f6 here. I think it was knight f6. There was like rook c1, queen b6, bishop c4, takes, takes, and queen b4 here. And it's a very long line. That game did end in a draw. It's a variation that I was vaguely familiar with, uh, but I chose not to play it because in my mind, I was thinking about what the possibilities were. And when I went g3, I was expecting Ali Reza to play bishop e7 and the classical setup. Instead, Ali Reza took on d4, and as soon as he traded on d4 and played bishop c5, I realized that he had tricked me. This is a variation that I have actually faced in the past, but it's something which I have not played in a very, very long time. Now, more specifically, I haven't faced this variation since the year 2019, a different lifetime ago, before the pandemic, before I was actually streaming every day, um, and I had it two times. Now, the first game... Uh, which was played in the Moscow Fide Grand Prix in May of 2019, went knight b3, bishop b6 against Daniil Dubov. We'll talk about that a little bit more. In the second game in June of 2019 against Dubov, I actually traded the knights on c6. And I believe it went castles, castles, knight a4, bishop d6, takes, takes, and something like bishop g5. I would win this game in Paris in the, in the Grand Chess Tour, but all these games are kind of a blur in my mind, and obviously this was five years ago in a different world. So I play knight b3. Bishop b6, castles, and now d4, knight a4, castles, and I play the move bishop g5. And here, Ali Reza plays h6. Now, in my game against Dubov from the FIDE Grand Prix in Moscow in 2019, he played this move rook to e8, and after takes, takes, e3, d3, takes, takes. This was a very, very strange position because black has two sets of double isolated pawns here, two towers of power, a weak pawn on d3, a weak pawn on h7. Nonetheless, the computer thinks that black is relatively okay in this position, and the game would end in a draw. Ali Reza, however, plays the move h6 instead. I take on f6, he takes, and now I decide to play the move rook c1. Now, this is a move that I played after a little bit of a thing, not super long. Obviously, here I was spending a lot of time. As you'll notice, I'm already down over 35 minutes on the clock. So I play rook c1. He goes rook e8. Now, in retrospect, I thought that Ali Reza should have played bishop g4 right away to try and put pressure on this diagonal, and then followed it up with the move rook e8 later. Instead, he goes rook e8, and now I'm able to play his move h3 here, stopping black from developing the bishop to this diagonal to pressure the pawn on e2. So once this happens, I actually felt okay about myself. I was kind of worried about some other lines. Like I thought if I took, for example, and played knight c1, I wasn't sure what was going on in a position like this, where black is knight d4, bishop e6, bishop g4. 
all kinds of threats in the center of the board here, along with all these open files. And against someone who's very well prepared, you don't want to be in such a situation. So that's why I played rook c1. We got rook e8. Now I played h3. He goes bishop f5, and I'm able to play his move knight b c5, trying to put a lot of pressure on this long light square diagonal. Ali Reza trades the bishop. I take, and now he plays his move b6. Black could play d3 once again here, and after knight d3, rook a d8. Black has great rooks in the center of the board. There's a lot of pressure with knight d4 coming. And probably the best I can do here is to play something like rook e1, knight d4, e3, takes, and e takes d4. Simplifying the position and making a draw after takes, takes. Probably, actually, queen d4 is apparently wrong. Maybe he's supposed to take with the rook. Bishop b7. And then something like bishop f5. Although, actually, white looks a little bit better here, so I'm a little bit confused. But nonetheless, this position after rook d8 looks very, very scary to play for white. Instead, he goes b6. And now I play the move knight d3, trying to pressure this knight on c6. Ali Reza plays bishop e4, getting rid of the light square b's. And now I trade the bishops and play this move queen c2. Now, a lot of the smoke is cleared here. We're sort of in the late middle game. But I do have one slight advantage here, which is black has this weak d4 pawn that's blockaded. And I'm trying to play on the c file as well. Ali Reza goes rook e6. I play knight f4. He goes rook d6. And now I play this move queen e4 rook d8 and i go rook fd1 now at this point i have achieved the optimal setup i have the rooks on the c and the d files here i'm trying to pressure the pawn on d4 and the queen on e4 also controls the e file so at this point i was starting to feel a little bit confident thinking i might get some chance to win but ali reza really does not give me any chances here as he now plays this move g5 in this position attacking the knight on f4 and the knight has to retreat to d3 which now lets black go rook e6 and try to play on the e file and pressure this pawn on e2 here i go queen g4 moving the queen away and guarding the pawn on e2 at the same time in this position ali reza now plays the move knight to e5 I trade the knights and I play the move rook c2. Now, in retrospect, I thought perhaps I should have played the move rook to d2 instead. And the reason is that in the game after rook c2, queen f6 in this position, I thought that I could go king f1, but black can now play the move rook d to e8, pressuring the pawn on e2 and threatening rook to e4. And if I play the obvious move, queen takes d4, now there's queen f5 hitting the rook and the pawn at the same time. Whereas the other line, if I have the rook on d2 and I go king f1, the rook will never be hanging in the long term. Alas, I play rook c2, queen f6. Now I decide to play h4 after a bit of a think, and Ali Reza plays this move, rook d e8. Now this is a very, very good move from Ali Reza as the pawn on d4 can be captured, but black always has enough counterplay as the pawn on e2 is weak in return. So here I decide to make a draw after takes, rook d4, Ali Reza takes the pawn, sacking a rook temporarily, but now I can't check on d8 as the queen covers the square, so I take, he takes, and in this position we, we agree to a draw. The way the game probably would have continued is I would have played queen to e7, attacking the pawns on g5 and a7, and now black probably just makes a repetition here with queen d5, queen d1, and queen h5, creating all the classic right triangles in this position. So... This means that we have a pretty boring draw in the classical game. I'm not super thrilled by it, but it is what it is. Didn't really get any great chances, and we move to the Armageddon game. So in this Armageddon game, I'm playing with the white pieces here against um, our Ali Reza. Obviously, 10 minutes versus 7, and I decide to play d4 once again. Ali Reza plays d5, c4, c6, and now I play knight f3. Now, I'm a little bit surprised that Ali Reza chose to play the Slav defense rather than playing... His regular e6 c5 semi trash or the trash defense altogether, but he probably wanted to surprise me just like I surprised Fabiano in the first round when I played one thing in the classical portion and then switched up in the R Mega Dog. So he gets c6 here. Now I play knight f3, he goes knight f6, and I play his move e3 here, trying to develop the bishop and guard the pawns. We get bishop f5, knight c3, e6, knight h4, bishop e4, f3. I might be going through this a little bit quickly, you guys, but all this is pretty standard and well known. We get bishop g6, I, I play bishop d2, bishop e7, I take the bishop, and now I go queen c2, trying to castle my king out of the center of the board. Now, I don't necessarily think this line is horrible for black, but I think in an Armageddon game, it's a very bad choice for a couple of reasons. Black doesn't really want to castle kingside because white can start pushing P on the kingside with H4, G4, H5. So you don't want to castle. At the same time, white wants to castle and play for E4 or these aforementioned kingside pawn pushes, which means that black is in a situation where if you use a lot of time, try to come up with an idea and hope that it works. And an Armageddon with no increment where you're already down on time, I think it's just a bad strategy. 
So all he has to take is on c4, plays knight d5, I castle, and now he goes knight to d7, and here I play the move king d1. Now, as I said, black doesn't really want to castle because now I can try to play h4, h5, or even e4, creating the classic big white center. So black is really struggling here. All he has is to start using time, and things are already kind of going the wrong direction. So all he has to play is rook c8. Here I go knight to e2 with the idea of playing e4. Now, the computer will say that I could have played e4 right away because after knight b4, queen c1, and knight b6, it looks like after bishop e2, I'm losing a pawn, but apparently after bishop e3, queen e5, and bishop d4, white is simply quite a bit better. Alas, in an Armageddon game, it's very tricky and delicate balance between when do you use your time and when do you just try to play quickly. Now, at this point, I thought knight e2 was simple because I want to play e4 and I want to dodge any of these ideas with knight b6 or knight b4. So Alireza goes b5, I play bishop d3, and now he plays this move c5, which is in fact a blunder. Now, what Alireza should have played here was the move a6 first to guard the pawn, followed up by c5. But it's easy to say this in retrospect. At the time, you can tell Alireza already down to 5 minutes and 40 seconds versus my 8 minutes. He's trying to play quickly. Now, if he uses 1 or 2 minutes and he finds a6 and c5, I think there's a very good chance that he would not have lost this game. But where do you use the time versus moving quickly on instinct? It's a very, very delicate balance. Yesterday, for example, against Magus, I moved quickly in the critical moments when I should have used my time. So it's always very, very difficult. I'm not going to fault Ali Reza. So he plays c5. Here I decide to take this pawn after a bit of a thing, nearly one minute. Initially, I wanted to take the pawn here. So if black takes on d4, I have queen a4 pinning this knight on d7. And if black were to take here, now I have this nice move, bishop a5. And look at d's bishops on the diagonals here. Black is actually completely lost. You can't move this knight because of the pin. If you move this one, I take the knight, takes, and after rook d7, you lose the queen and you lose the game in a very brutal fashion. But I didn't play this because after bishop b5, I saw that Ali Reza could castle here, and I simply didn't see the computer move, which was this move rook c1. Now, again, it's very important to Armageddon. What, where do you use your time? How do you, how do you conceptualize it? And the reason is I didn't see rook c1. So what I thought was maybe I go queen b3, but now after rook b8, suddenly there's all kinds of pressure on the b file, and I'm going to have to burn a lot of clock, and probably things are going to go the wrong way. So after a bit of a think, I decided instead to take the pawn, and now Ali Reza castles. Now, he could have played rook c5, but I saw that after queen b3, I'm pressuring this pawn on b5 very quickly, but I also am threatening to play e4 and kick this knight out of town. One sample line is a6, e4, knight b6, but now after bishop to e3, suddenly it looks like I should be better. Apparently after rook c8, black is still fine, but it's not so easy to play. So Ali Reza instead castles. Now I go bishop takes b5. He plays knight takes pawn. Apparently rook takes is better for whatever reason. I thought after takes queen b3 followed by e4. Again, I should be better, but I guess he has queen c7 and rook to b8. So all he to takes with the knight. I play e4, kicking the knight away. He goes queen b6, and now I take the knight. Now, if you were to move the knight to b6, for example, here, I can go bishop f4, and suddenly the queen is really lacking in squares. So you have to go knight to d7, and probably after takes, takes, and something like queen to a4, I'm hitting the knight. You have knight b6 here, but after takes, 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 let's just say takes, and something like rook c1, white is simply up one pawn here. You have uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, seis, uno, dos, tres, cuatro, cinco, white should be winning. So he goes queen b6. I take the knight, he takes my bishop, I go knight c3, attacking the queen, queen b7, and now I take this pawn on e6. Now this move was a slight mistake for me. I probably should have played bishop e3 here, because after bishop f6, I can play bishop to d4, blocking this diagonal, and once again, I maintain an extra pawn in the center of the board. But the thing is, when I took the pawn on e6, I missed that in this position, Ali Reza could play this move, bishop f6, trying to line up a bunch of threats on the queen side. After takes, let's just say rook f7 and rook e1, white is better here, but it looks really, really scary with this bishop, the queen, and the rook all aiming towards my queen side. Instead, Ali Reza plays knight e6, which computer says is the best move, but after this move, all chances of counterplay or an attack on the queen side simply go out the window because I play the move queen to e4 here plays rook c6, and now I have this nice move, knight to d5. It takes away threats on the diagonal. After bishop to a3 is played, now I go bishop b4, forcing the bishop to come off the board, and now the game is effectively over from the standpoint that Ali Reza is down four minutes on the clock, and he's down a pawn as we head into the end game. So he trades the bishops. I take with the knight, of course. He moves rook b6. I trade the queens, and now I go knight d5 back. 
Now, the position is not winning here for me yet, but I'm up a pawn here. I have five pawns versus four. Black also has one of one of the pawns being a stacked set of pawns. So the two-on-one on the queen side, the extra pawn, and the fact that I'm up three minutes on the clock, at this point, I would say it's pretty hopeless. So Ali Reza plays g5. I go h4, plays g takes. I take back. Now I have the idea of rook to h1, threatening the checkmate on the h file. He plays f6. I go rook e4, king f7. And now I play this move knight to e3 with the idea of rallying knight to either f5 or c4 and going for the fork on d6. Ali Reza plays rook c7. I go knight to f5. And now he plays move knight g5. Here I play rook to d4, and he plays this move g6. Now the idea behind rook d4 is to line up the kebab on the seventh rank with rook d7. To get g6, I play this move knight to d6. He goes king g8, and now I play this move b3, trying to anchor the horse on c4 with the pawn supporting it, and then creating the kebab on either d7 or d8 with the double stack. So we get f5, I play the move knight c4, Ali Reza goes king g7, and now I play this move rook to e1. Reasoning behind rook e1 is I'm trying to dominate this horse. Black would love to be able to bring the horse back into the game to, to square like f4, where he can target the pawn on g2. So when I play this move rook to e1, now the knight can't get back to the center as both the squares on e4 and e6 are simply covered. So he goes rook h8 here. At this point, of course, I'm up two minutes, no increment yet. It's just hopeless. I play knight d6 with the idea of going knight e8 and forking the king and the rook. He plays rook c6, and now I play this move knight to e8. He goes king f8, and I play rook to d8. And here, Ali Reza basically resigns the game. I think he tried to play knight to f7. He was flagging, but even after knight to f7 here, I can simply go rook to a8. And there are all kinds of threats here. I'm attacking the pawn. I have all kinds of fossils by moving the knight. It's interesting the computer says after a6, it's not lost on the spot, but probably after checking rook a7, you're going to lose the pawn in a6 or something bad is going to happen on 7th rank, and just no chance in a top-level game of salvaging. So, after rook to d8, Ali Reza resigns the game before completing the move with knight to f7, which means that I win the Armageddon game. I get the 1.5 points, uh, which is the maximum I could get since we drew the classical portion. Ali Reza gets 1 point, so I earn the extra half point by winning this game similarly like i did against fabiano and then yesterday where magnus got the extra half point against me so i get this nice match win by winning the clown fiesta in the armageddon game it's nice to win the armageddon as i said yesterday for me if i play well in classical don't make any big mistakes i'll be happy regardless of whether i win the armageddons or lose them as long as i don't mess up in classical i'm always going to be somewhat satisfied so i get the win uh, with the Armageddon matchup. Now, you're probably wondering, well, what happened in the other games? Now, today was very exciting as the other two matches were decided in the classical portion. Fabiano Caruana defeated the current world chess champion, Ding Loren, in a masterpiece in the classic Gucci piano with the white pieces. So he collects a very valuable three points. But in even more shocking news, the Indian super talent, Ramesh Babu Pragnanan, ha, 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 crushed Magnus Carlsen and opens the ceiling today with the white piece, a game that, in my opinion, is one of the best games I've seen. It actually reminds me of some of the great games that I saw Vishy Anand, the Indian legend, win in the late 90s uh, in, in various events. Um, nonetheless, Prague beats Magnus as well, so he also gets three points. I think that means that currently I'm sitting, I think, in third place, if I'm not mistaken, after Prague and Fabiano. Tomorrow I will play with the white pieces, I believe, against Prague and Anhaha, if I'm not mistaken. So it's going to be a very exciting game, but with the two decisive games, this really does shake up the tournament, as now we're not in a situation where the Armageddon games matter as much. So it should lead to more decisive games as we move forward. So... On that note, I hope you've enjoyed this recap from the third round of Norway Chess. I know I didn't cover the Magnus game. You're probably wondering why I didn't, but I'm trying to I'm trying to do these relatively short videos rather than have an hour-long recap. And obviously, I need to prepare. I need to go eat dinner, get ready for tomorrow as well. So it is what it is in case you are wondering. But I hope you guys have enjoyed this recap. If you are not already subscribed to my channel, make sure that you smash that subscribe button below. And we'll be back tomorrow after the fourth round when I play against Ramesh Babu Pragnanantaha from India. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. Have a great rest of your day. See you soon. Bye.